Chapter 3 of The Mandalorian was a doozy. It was my favorite episode so far. The show is moving at a much faster pace than I ever would have guessed, and I love that. On the way back to the Bounty Hunters Guild, the Mando bonds with the child a little bit. Not really on purpose, but how could you not instantly fall in love with that little bundle of green? But a job is a job, and he turns Baby Yoda over to the Imperials. It's clear that the client hired IG-11, the Trandoshans, and many more bounty hunters to make sure the job got done, but the Mando is the one that pulled through, so he is rewarded with an ice cream maker full of Beskar. I loved the return of that prop. Although the Mando shows some curiosity regarding what will be done with the child, he takes his reward and goes straight to the armorer, catching the eyes of his fellow Mandalorians along the way. They are clearly not a fan of him working with the Empire, and then we get to dive a little more into what happened to their people. It sounds like it was the Empire that caused the Great Purge, and the reason the Mandalorians now live in hiding. I wonder if all of that best car was taken off Mandalorian warriors and then melted down into currency. Last week I talked a lot about how bounty hunting is a profession that is beneath the Mando, and that all the Mandalorian people have been reduced to this dishonorable state. Taking precious armor that was passed down for generations and turning it into money is another symbol of that. The blacksmith seems to have no problem using it to create new armor, but the other Mandalorians, specifically a large one, takes issue with it. The bigger Mandalorian calls the Mando a coward for working with the Empire and tries to take his helmet off, causing the two of them to come to blows. And they even pull vibroblades on each other, which we can see vibrating on screen, which I thought was a nice touch. The armorer calms things down and reaffirms that anyone who chooses the Mandalorian way of life can't be a coward. The fact that she says he chose this life supports my thought that the Mando isn't actually from any known Mandalorian house, but instead could be founding his own. That he might not be a true Mandalorian and is now struggling to prove himself. She also asks if he's ever removed his helmet or if it's been removed by others, so the bigger guy's attempt to take it off was an attempt to shame him. By the way, that Mandalorian is credited as Paz Vizsla in the credits, related to Pre and Tar Vizsla, one of the biggest Mandalorian clans we know. So we do have this big-name guy telling the Mando that he isn't worthy. Fortunately, that's not up to him, and the armorer just keeps going on with her job, offering to use the Mudhorn as the Mando's signet after learning about his fight but he turns it down because he had help from Baby Yoda during the battle. Basically, he's feeling guilty about leaving his little green son with the Empire. Last week, he got an egg for Jawas and then watched them rip it apart. This week, he turned over the egg-shaped crib to the Empire, and he can't stop thinking about what might be happening to it. Chapter 3 is titled The Sin, and that is the sin. So he gets his new set of flashy armor, and again, as it's being forged, we see more flashbacks to the Clone Wars. And this time, it's more clear what's happening. We actually get to see Separatist ships and super battle droids. He is again hidden away in a bunker, only to be discovered by a droid, and the flashback ends. I think the next time we see one of those sequences, we're going to see some Mandalorians come in to destroy that droid, save him, and adopt him into their culture. I've still got Fallen Order on the mind, but these forging scenes remind me of something similar that happens in the game that I won't get into for fear of spoilers, but there is this idea that your past traumas become a part of who you are. They forged the Mando into the person he is now. And that person is someone fully decked out in Beskar. Man, I talked a long time about that armorer scene, but it had so much going on. We can finally go into the cantina where Grief Karga makes a big show of his new best employee, the Mando, for succeeding in capturing the baby when no other hunter could. It seems to me that the rules of the guild have been lacking since the fall of the Empire. In previous stories, we've been shown that poaching another hunter's bounty is super against the rules, but it seems like it's straight up encouraged now. It also feels like everyone on this planet is a bounty hunter, like this is the guild planet or something. Karga is busy enjoying his cut of the Mando's reward, but the Mando only wants his next job. He's got everything he wanted, a full set of Beskar armor and his choice of the bounties, but he's still not satisfied. He's feeling guilty, and he's just trying to distract his mind. So he takes his next job and is about to head out when he gets one final reminder of the baby that saved his life, and he just can't do it. The rest of the episode is just an awesome action sequence that is so my jam. I love a good one-man army sequence. The Mando returns to the Imperial compound, blows a hole in the wall, and blasts his way back to Baby Yoda. There are some interesting hints dropped about what the Empire wants with the baby. Dr. Pershing mentioned that someone explicitly wanted the baby to be brought back alive, but Werner Herzog just asks him to extract the necessary material. 
My best guess is that they want to extract metachlorians, but Pershing insists that the baby would already be dead if not for him, and as of right now, I believe the guy. I do think he's trying to protect the child to a degree, and the Mando spares him. So now he's going on a rampage with a baby in his arms, which gives off some real hard-boiled or shoot 'em up vibes. I like that four stormtroopers surround him at one point because it immediately reminds you of the scene in the first episode where they say they have him 4-1, to one, and he just says he likes those odds. And he easily takes them out with his fancy new weapons. There's no sign of Werner Herzog, so he leaves the compound, and you get to let out this little sigh of relief, but then all the bounty hunters on the planet are alerted that the baby is once again on the move. So now, the Mando's gotta fight his way out of the entire city. And super props to Deborah Chow for that whole sequence. The suspense is built perfectly from the moment that first tracker lights up to the moment the first shot is fired. And then that whole fight was so Western. Favreau has talked about the Western inspirations of this show a lot, but I still really enjoy seeing them. So many tropes are used, and I don't even care because it's just fun to see them in a Star Wars setting. But I love that he dives into the cart and then has to convince the droid instead of a horse to get him out of there. But then the droid is shot, so then there's another standoff. The Mando again reminds me of Indiana Jones, just making things up as he goes, or we could compare him to Jen Erso. He's using every chance he gets until he succeeds or the chances are spent. And Deborah Chow makes excellent use of things we already know from the previous two episodes. For example, just seeing the two prongs of the Mando's rifle peek out of cover just fills you with this sense of anticipation. You know it's about to go down. But still, the Mando can't fight his way out alone, and when all hope seems lost, we get our Han Solo saving the day moment. The other Mandalorians come flying in with their jetpacks to fight, and that's when my jaw hit the floor. This felt like it was straight out of the Clone Wars, but we're seeing it in live action. How insane is that? All these Mandalorians, even Paz Vizsla, the people who looked down on him earlier in the episode and saw him as unworthy, now accept him and support him. And it has nothing to do with his armor. It's not like he got a full set and they all agreed he was a good guy. No, they see him trying to protect a child, and that's when they see him as one of their own. So the Mando escapes the city, but Karga is on his ship waiting. They have a brief standoff, but the Mando distracts him, shoots him, and leaves him for dead. Again, that felt like it was pulled straight out of a western, especially the reveal that something in Grief's pocket saved his life. I thought the Mando would face some consequences for shooting IG-11, and I was wrong about that, but I have to imagine the leader of the guild isn't going to take this lying down, and neither will the Empire. The Mando flies off to safety, and Paz Vizsla flies next to him to offer a salute of respect. That was probably the one moment I didn't like in the whole episode, it just felt so real-world, like Superman coming up to say, good job. But I did like the Mando's line to himself that he needs to get himself a jetpack. Yes, you do. I'm glad there's still some classic Mandalorian stuff for him to acquire. But for now, he just enters hyperspace, and that's the end of the chapter. I was really surprised by this episode. I was expecting the Mando to turn over the baby and get his armor, but then I thought we'd marinate in his guilt for a while. I thought he'd go back to Baby Yoda at the end of the season, and everything we just saw would be the season finale. And it did feel like a finale to me. I'm just surprised and delighted that it all happened so quickly. This show is moving at a breakneck pace, which is great. I love thinking I'm so smart knowing how the rest of the story will play out only to have something like this happen, because now I have no idea what'll happen next. We've got five more episodes and we've blown through all the major plot points that I guessed. This reminded me a lot of a Clone Wars arc. I feel like this was already a story with a beginning, middle, and end told incredibly well by Dave Filoni, Rick Famuyiwa, and Deborah Chow. We're getting that sequence of directors again for chapters 5, 6, and 7, so I'm excited to see what they do next time. As for what's to come, I think we can absolutely expect consequences for what the Mando did in Chapter 3. Cargo will probably place a bounty on his head, but we already know of a bigger bad that the Imperials were working for. I'm guessing that person the Doctor was referring to will be Moff Gideon. He's got his own personal army of Storm and Death Troopers, and I don't think they're just gonna shrug and say, oh well, to losing Baby Yoda. And I still refuse to believe IG-11 is gone for good. The Mando has made a lot of enemies. But we also know he's about to make an ally in Cara Dune. I hope she features prominently in the rest of the season. We've been told her first episode was directed by Bryce Dallas Howard, and that's listed as episode 4. I've been intrigued by her character since we first learned she was an ex-Rebel shock trooper, and I can't wait to finally see her kick some ass alongside the Mando. 
But yeah, as of right now, this was my favorite episode of the series. It was a fantastic conclusion to the story so far. If these three episodes had just been a movie, I would have been satisfied. But we're not even halfway through the season, and I'm still loving the exploration of who the Mando is, his motivations, and his search for worth among his own culture. I still think he'll be taking that helmet off by the end, despite it apparently being against the rules. Again, I think it'll be a commentary on what it means to be a Mandalorian, that it's not the armor, but your actions. Hell, we've seen plenty of Mandalorians remove their helmets, so maybe this is just like an initiation thing. But that's all I've got to say about Chapter 3, The Sin. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments. Normally, you could expect a long-form discussion from us to come out later today, but Molly is at a friend's wedding, so we'll save it for another time. Until then, you can enjoy our audio commentaries for the first two chapters on our Patreon page by following the link in the description. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.